Welcome to the Times of Industry show. I'm excited to have a first time guest who has correctly timed the January correction to the day. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in our interview. We don't get the chance to catch up with many investors of Jason's caliber. So we're glad he took the time today to share with us uh, his takes on what's going on with the markets. And especially we'll go into specifics regarding um, some opportunities that Jason sees himself uh, going forward. Jason, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Hey, um, let's uh, l let's jump right into what is your system. Can you share with us what do you do and, and how did this come to be? Sure. I think uh, a good jumping off point would be going over some background. I spent uh, about 14 or so years in Wall Street and London City trading and selling equity derivatives to large institutions. So the for their hedge funds and asset managers. And uh, basically, I was fortunate enough to be in a unique position to handle some of the largest equity order flow in the world, stock order flow. And basically, one day we received an order to purchase some stock in a company. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it XYZ. And by the end of the day, we had purchased a million shares. So I sat on an institutional trading desk that had over 250 salesmen covering thousands of hedge funds in the country and worldwide. And we would put together large trades. So we traded about a million shares of this stock. It was probably about uh, $20 million at the time for one trade throughout the day. Uh, it was very exciting until the next day we got the same order and lo and behold, the stock started to rise, and we traded another million shares. And uh, we repeated this order day after day for about 20 trading days for a month. Um, it didn't take long to realize that something unusual was going on, and someone was building a large stake, and there was seemingly unending appetite for this stock. We found out competitors were trading it. People were trading listed options, over-the-counter non-listed options. Um, I never did find out who the identity of this buyer was until uh, a few days after the conclusion of the order. But at that point, the stock had already risen more than 50% in a month. So really recognizing something rather unusual at the time we found out through a 13D filing, which is a um, SEC required filing, when someone takes a material stake of ownership in a company acquiring more than 5% or 5% or more of the company. And we found out it was an activist hedge fund manager who managed many billions of dollars who was taking an activist stake in this company and uh, ended up purchasing... I guess about 15% of the float outstanding. So we're talking about a billion dollars worth of stock passed through my hands and it was really unique. But the point of all this is it showed me what impact large institutions can have. And this wasn't particularly an insider yet. He was acquiring his own stake of the share to become a board member, et cetera, and do activism within. However, what it pointed out is when someone outsizes the market, whether they're a buyer or a seller, there's really only one way for that stock to go. In this case, the buyer was buying the stock and it was not a terrific uh, backdrop in the market, yet the stock still rallied immensely. These gave us clues, which enabled me to eventually code up algorithms to look for this type of order flow without actually sitting on a trading desk or hearing any information. So this became the basis of our system. So my system really is identifying unusual institutional activity in stocks. And I'm looking for unusual buying activity and unusual selling activity. And we will take it a step further by rating over 4,000 U.S. stocks every day. We actually do this globally across 15,000 stocks. But in the U.S., we're doing 4,000 stocks a day. We score those stocks, and we're looking for unusual institutional buying in the best stocks. 
an unusual institu- institutional selling in the worst stocks. And if you can think of like a normal bell curve, uh, we tend to live our lives in the tails. And what we found is our trade identification over five years of live history that we have and multi years of back testing. Um, beyond that, we have about a 70% accuracy of trade with a nine month sweet spot. So what that means out of thousands of stocks that we've identified as buys, 70% of them have won and have outperformed the market over a nine month period. So that in essence is our system. So Jason, do investors like this one uh, wish to remain anonymous so they can uh, build up uh, as big of a, as big of a position as possible without uh, creating a situation where where his competitors are trying to bid up the stock and then he'll have to pay more for this? Or um, does he make his uh, awareness known so that the market will actually rally the stock and he'll show that the uh, he'll show the board board members that his influence is actually um, uh, positive in its impact? Do they like to keep it uh, on the low or because I've seen a lot of times that they tweet out or th- they make sure that uh, everybody else knows, hey, we're buying the stock, we're aggressively buying the stock, we like the stock, etc. Well, uh, I think you hit it, hit it on the head the first time around. Uh, from my observation over the years of working institutional orders, people like their identity rem- to remain anonymous and especially until they've <laughs> built their position, I don't think uh, many investors are going to go try and compete against themselves in the sense that you wouldn't tweet out that you're buying a stock to watch it race higher to then initiate your buy. More often than not, people disclose their position once they've made their way into it. And like you said, watch all their competitors and other people rally the stock uh, around the news. So, you know, typically people want to remain anonymous and and the whole institutional sales community is all based around uh, brokers and traders and sales traders keeping their clients identity uh, unknown. So, you know, I think large institutional investors, especially activists, people looking to take a stake, want to as quietly as possible build their position. But one thing that you just touched upon, Lior, is if the position is huge, imagine you're a $500 billion sovereign wealth fund and you want to take a meaningful position in a stock, it's probably going to outsize the average daily volume of multiple days. So you're going to make a splash on day one, try and get as much stock as you can at the lowest price possible because it's not going to be long before other people catch wind of it, start riding on your coattails or buying it uh, through competitors outside of you, driving the price higher. Perfect. So let's go back to what is your service? What do you do uh, um, with this information, with this algorithm? Yeah, we have, uh, so like I said, I spent about 15 years on Wall Street, and eventually my trade ideas were becoming very popular with the clients, and I was encouraged to go out and uh, do this research on my own which uh, I did along with a partner. We founded our company, MAP, and we do equity research um, for institutional investors as well as individuals. So we have a host of products that basically, through our system, we look for these unusual institutional accumulation on stocks, on the best stocks, and then we release that information to our clients because they are high probability trade ideas that within nine months, you're going to see some pretty excellent returns. And, uh, you know, a great example is almost a year ago to the day, I think it was April 11th, I was giving a seminar here in Palm Beach at a Traders Association, and the uh, number one stock that we picked that day was SolarEdge, S-E-D-G, and I think it's up north of 250% in about a year. So those are the types of trades we're trying to identify. Our client. Very interesting. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to to kind of ask you about more of a macro question. 
Uh, Ray Dalio has been on the news a lot lately, uh, talking about the rise of populism in the U.S. He equates the risk involved with the, with the times today um, with the 1930s. Now, he says that when you look at economic data um, or uh, when you travel across the U.S., you see two countries, basically. You see the wealthy and you see the lower income and the eroding middle class. And he's talking about the fact that this will have a negative impact on the stock market overall, and it might have a negative impact on the bonds market as well as uh, going to create more government intervention because the U.S. is less resilient to recessions um, as, uh, as it stands, as a country. Do you share this? Do you agree with this? Or do you disagree with this? What, where do you see, because you, you get to the leverage of uh, uh, being both in Florida and in, uh, in, in New York City, but you also have clients around the country. So can you share with us uh, what do you see personally in terms of uh, where America is going? That's a really interesting question. And um, I think my perspective, I tend to be more data-driven in the sense that I tend to follow trends. Um, therefore, I, I kind of let the data dictate to me where things are going because I found historically in my career when I trade or make investment decisions based on emotion, I'm usually at the exact opposite time that I need to be or, or doing the exact opposite of what I need to do. So what, what I can tell you in terms of what the data is that I'm looking at recently you know, we are having some of the best sales and earnings reports in decades. We're forecasting the best sales and earnings growth, I believe, at 17.2% uh, since 2011. Um, more companies are releasing positive guidance than ever before. Uh, so we're seeing a very vibrant economy in corporate America. There could be some... You know, division, of course, in the country in terms of uh, wealth and poverty. However, there is real tax reform that is benefiting kind of everyone. And uh, yet there there is inflation that's alive and well when you see it at the gas pump. So it, it impacts everyone. I do believe that um, there's always going to be a division unless we become a socialist nation. We are a you know, a, a, a nation built on on democracy and capitalism. So I don't necessarily see us heading down the path of 1930s. Uh, the rise of populism and and division of a nation is definitely not a pleasant thing to witness. But there are many people in the other camp that say, you know, um, prior. Uh, the administration was more taxing on the average American due to sort of the social welfare welfare of the average American coming out of the pockets of, of average American mandated health insurance, et cetera. So uh, I, I think that's more of a political question than um, sort of the future of the state of the economy. But overall, if I'm just going to look at cold, hard data, the numbers are fantastic, and they seem like they're going to be better come April, the next earnings season. And I don't think um, corporate America or even you know Wall Street analysts have fully been able to digest the impact of corporate tax reform and how it's going to relate to the bottom lines of corporate America. And I think it's going to be a very positive impact. Very interesting. Um, I'd like to ask you about um, <clears throat> a subject that impacts uh, virtually everyone, and that's the bonds market. Um, many investors are thinking how to prepare for a bonds bear market, a potential bear market in bonds due to the fact that the Fed is raising their the Fed's fund rate, um, yields on the 10-year uh, bond, on the 2-year bond, on the 5-year bond, across the board. Yields are rising, um, and they're rising uh, quite significantly. Now, we talked about this at wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash bonds. It's a special report we wrote about uh, the potential for a bonds bear market, why rising rates are, are bad for bonds, and where can people position to get high fixed uh, income yield instead of bonds. Do you see uh, a scenario where bonds are 
uh, <clears throat> are very, very uh, risky going forward? Well, I think uh, bonds have been a difficult market for a long time due to such protracted low interest rates. You know, um, for a long time, you were even having negative real return on bonds because rates were so low and not keeping pace with inflation or cost of living increases every year. I think uh, the rate increases on the horizon are nothing new, you know, all through um, Bernanke and Janet Yellen's uh, dovish terms as Fed chairman. They all said we would raise rates when the economy justified in doing so. And uh, what we've seen is a, a growing, vibrant economy, which does justify some rate rises. It, it is interesting that last week, um, the Fed speech by Jerome Powell, Powell, rather, let me say that again, the Fed uh, meeting with Jerome Powell, the comments were actually overall fairly dovish. Um, they did hint to more rate rises on the horizon. However, they hinted to three additional rate rises as opposed to four. What does this all mean for bonds? Obviously, higher rates uh, negatively impact current bonds. What I do think it's really good for for people looking for higher yields are great dividend stocks. You know, growing equities that grow their dividends. There are plenty of companies out there that double their dividends every six to seven years. And you're starting to see, um, you know, a, a situation where you have a really strong equity market last year and you have great companies paying great dividends. You're, you're getting phenomenal rates of return that can't be matched by fixed income. So, um, I don't, I don't necessarily see it as catastrophic for the bond market. You're always going to have a vibrant bond market just due to the credit worthiness of the United States. But uh, there are certainly higher yield instruments elsewhere. I, I don't think it's going to change when there's, you know, ish, incidences like last week where there's fear in the market. You're still going to see people fleeing to the safety of treasuries and you're going to see yields compress, etc., but uh, in, in the coming months or years, yes, I mean, uh, we're going to see higher rates eventually is going to be um, interesting for bondholders who hold further out the term. But obviously, uh, for our current bonds, it's, it's, not, it's not ideal. Now, Jason, let's talk about uh, a classic scenario, uh, Buffett-style trade. Uh, the opioids crisis has made some of the drug distributors, for example, very cheap, quite unloved. Uh, is this a classic scenario where uh, this is a short-term problem uh, and it's very fixable and it's a buying opportunity for some of these companies that have seen their, um, their share prices plummet, but they haven't really seen their earnings or their margins or their dividend yield uh, go down. In fact, it, it, some of them have uh, sustained this uh, without um, without any problems. They are being examined. They are being looked at by uh, by state officials, etc. But the companies, but the companies are some of them are robust. Is this uh, uh, reminding you of the 1960s where uh, everyone was afraid of uh, American Express and Buffett was buying American Express? Uh, you know, on left and right. Is this the type of scenario that we're at? And do you feel the same way about companies that uh, manufacture cigarettes, for example? Interesting. So let's address the uh, opioids first. I, I think uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Here's where long-term philosophy of investing differs uh, from the approach that I take in my day-to-day -day research. So just, just as a caveat, as an aside, I look for stocks that are trending higher, that have great fundamental superior earnings, low debt, great market share, and all these great qualities that are in addition being accumulated by institutions. It's sort of like stacking the odds in your favor. However, with that said, I can get alerts on stock like those. Uh, for instance, Facebook for years, uh, I think it started coming on our radar in the uh, around $47 and, you know, was up over 200 quite recently. And then 
with all the headlines pouncing on them about uh, Cambridge data analytics, acquiring their data and potentially using it to implicate an illegitimate election, you know, the media gets all crazy and that gets carried away and people punish the stock. Currently, the earnings of Facebook is <laughs> nothing has changed from two weeks ago to now, but the stock is getting punished. So in a parallel in the opioid market, I think it's exactly the same. You have Jeff Sessions, who uh, obviously has it out for opioids and wants to go after the companies. But, you know, let's be honest, I think their earnings are not suffering. I think the fundamentals of the companies are probably still very strong until you see a mass exodus of clients out of their products, uh, you're not going to see major impact. And and let's be honest, uh, where are they going to buy their products? Elsewhere. So, you know, they're going to be going to international firms. I really think you are right, Lior, this is a case where it's overblown and will probably be a long-term buying opportunity. If the fundamentals of the company are there in terms of earnings and sales and we're dealing with companies that make money that pay dividends, that have large established distribution networks and are, are selling products globally, uh, I just see it as more short-term short noise, which would translate to a buying opportunity. And this, by the way, this could, this could stay protracted for months. You know, the prices could be depressed. But I think if you look five years from now, you're probably going to be um, – happy with the investment decision. That's why long-term investing differs from my approach in what I do. Now, uh, Joel Greenblatt, one of the best investors, uh, bar none, uh, for the past uh, few decades, has said that he believes that the market in the next 10 years will, will be down from where it is today. In other words, he's predicting a negative yield uh, for, the, for the next uh, decade. What will retirees do, uh, retirees that have a lot at stake with, uh, with their stock portfolio? Will they be needing to liquidate more than they expected? Will they be needing to liquidate some of their bonds or some of their real estate? Do you see the baby boomer demographics, uh, currently 51 million retirees, it's going to be about 81 million retirees by 2030, 2035. Do you see the next decade as being very, um, uh, deflationary for prices across the board just because there's so many people who are depending on their portfolios um, for retirement, for a lengthy retirement, and obviously with people aging, uh, this is becoming even a bigger problem. Hmm, that's an interesting, uh, interesting view. I tend to be a long-term bull myself um, for equities. Even in periods of extreme market pressure, they tend to last you know, call it six to 18 months until markets get uh, back on track. You go back to the housing crisis and we've seen equity rallies unparalleled in history ever since. Um, I think there would have to be a major catalyst in order to cause me to advise people to start liquidating their portfolios because, you know, First of all, these things don't happen overnight, typically. Uh, you have to travel from point A point to point B. You would start to see signs of things cracking in the market. I think recent equity corrections are nothing more than, you know, I think it grabs a lot of headlines, but let's not forget, we had north of 20% gains across almost every index last year. So that's a, that's a rather unique outlier of an equity performance. So I would expect the market takes a breath, sells off a little, rallies up. Um, I do believe the equity market has more bullish fuel given currently, echoing my prior statements about sales and earnings and record guidance. Um, you know, we have a lot fewer companies issuing negative guidance, a lot more companies issuing positive guidance. These are fuel for a positive economy. Once we see those figures starting to tail off or starting to change, maybe my opinion would change at that point. But, um, you know, until I see that data, 
I'm going to be bullish on U.S. equity. Very interesting. What are your thoughts on gold? Uh, I, you know, to be honest, I, I don't really have too many thoughts on gold other than um, it tends to be still a really safe haven when when things get ugly in equities and it becomes a risk off situation. I think it always pays to hold some gold in your portfolio, but um, you know, I'm not a gold bug. I don't necessarily focus all my energies on gold. I focus on equities. And right now, the gold equities have not really uh, popped onto my horizon uh, or my radar, so to speak, in a long time. So I, I can't really offer very valuable thoughts on gold right now. The uh, the gold equities. Let's go. Let's uh, dive into them real quick. What would need to happen for them to to appear on your radar? You would need to see institutional buying of uh, the largest miners, for example. Uh, th is this something that's uh, that is popular for large hedge fund manager to take a position with Barrick or with uh, uh, Gold Corp, etc., with one of the big ones? Yeah, I mean, listen. Um Gold companies have popped on our radar before. Um, they typically do so when you see falling equity prices and commodities are in a boom. And then we start to see margins increasing in gold. I think, uh, you know, right now, if I'm going to look on my radar, I have the screen in front of me. I'm looking at about 30 gold companies and across the board. You know, we're talking about the really middle of the range. Nothing jumps out at me as specifically having uh, very strong fundamentals with the exception of maybe Tahoe. Um, I, I'm not seeing much jumping out in terms of mining companies making, you know, significant gro sales growth and earnings. I, for it to come on my radar to answer your question... I have to see people buying it in massive size, uh, really pushing the stock out of its price ranges and volatility ranges. It's got to be hitting interim highs that I look at, and it's got to have superior fundamentals. So for right now, with 30 companies out of the 4,000 that I look at, they're all kind of middle of the road. So, you know, the trend has to be well underway in order for it to come under my radar, which means I'm never going to catch the bottom. I'm never going to nail the top in terms of the stock. But, uh, you know, going back to your comment about timing the market correction in January, the way we look at everything is through the lenses of what institutions are doing in an unusual way. So when all of a sudden they were just buying so much that it became unsustainable, that was our signal that we were going to expect uh, near term price pressure. And pardon me, the near term price pressure. And that that happened, you know, within days. Very interesting. Hey, Jason, to kind of wrap up, please share with people where they can see your work, kind of uh, look into what you're doing and uh, uh, just follow uh, your uh, uh, your Twitter handle and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, you can head over to our website. It's mapsignals.com, M-A-P-S-I-G-N-A-L-S.com. Um, we can be found on LinkedIn, Facebook, and I, I believe we have uh, the Twitter link on that website as well. And there you will find links about our services, our products, and um, how to get more information from us as well. Perfect. Well, hey, Jason, thank you very much. We'll have an update interview with you in about six months. Let's see where uh, a lot of these things are. And then we'll have an interview where we talk about specific stocks. We'll go through some of the ones that are really on your radar and kind of pick your brain regarding why you think they're great opportunities or great short opportunities, etc. Yeah, that sounds great. I, I love talking about stocks. I do it all day long. <laughs> Well, that, that's, that makes two of us, man. Well, that's great, and uh, um, uh, definitely uh, uh, we'll have you back on in a few months to, to catch up. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, and I hope you have a great day.